Hi everyone, and thanks for joining me for, it's going to be part 6 of New Testament Bible quotes in an Old Testament context. I have to admit that most likely the reason that I've been able to continue at this uh, for the amount of time that I have, and keep in mind, there are a lot there, there are a lot of New Testament quotes that, of course, have an Old Testament context. Because if we, if we go by the uh, uh, the the standard accumulation of knowledge uh, concerning all of this, uh, at the time that the books of the New Testament were written. And keep in mind, most of them were uh, just started out as letters. We can see that illustrated really good in uh, between what's called the Gospel of Luke and Acts. The nature of letters, uh, of course, is, is far more uh, prevalent in the writings of Paul, Peter, John, Jude. But you could consider, of course, Revelation as a book. Even the Gospels, in some ways, they seem like a letter form, as in specifically to a certain group of people. But, you know, I guess thinking about it, a lot of the books of the prophets, and of course even the, you know, the books of Torah, the Psalms, writings, they are to other people. All of this, all of this is writings from someone to someone for purposes of record, for purposes having contemporary purposes, and also having long-term eschatological purposes. So, uh, I guess that what I was going to say, though, I, I think the reason that I'm able to do so many of these without tiring because even as much as you can enjoy doing anything, you know, you can reach a point of, of being overloaded, which I do tend to do with a lot of things, and I have to, I really have to go between a number of, of various things. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know which it is, uh, my mind tends to branch itself out quite a lot, into various forms of knowledge, epistemology, and uh, there, there's almost nothing I can do about that except to try to stay uh, focused on just a few things as much as possible. Uh, it is oftentimes nice in the sense of almost uh, a relaxing thing to, of course, let the mind wander into, into various academic pursuits. Um, I do want to mention something before I start on this, because it's been on my mind for some time now, and it was just illustrated to me again yesterday, is that <clears throat> what I see emerging very much is a pattern, and it may be wrong for me to say it as in it's emerging, but it has become, let's say, the very much the, it has become dominant and has overshadowed, I guess, what I would consider, in my humble opinion, the pursuit of pure study of the scriptures. And, and that does include books that are deuterocanonical, so they were not included in, quote-unquote, the accepted canon, because I think we need to study those as well to determine whether or not they do belong with uh, the great body of information that we have. Remember, I see when I read the scriptures a singular voice speaking through the particularities of a number of different uh, penmen, let's say. Uh, however, 
uh, this pursuit of knowing and understanding the Bible. Because the people that are truly trying to understand the Bible, these are people that are truly trying to understand the mind and the heart of the living God of the Bible, the history of it, the people of it, uh, then and now. And so what I see as uh, something very problematic and I think quite dangerous because of its implications is how the the pure pursuits of studying the scripture is uh, nearly entirely overshadowed now with something uh, that's often called um, ancient Near Eastern studies. And ancient Near Eastern studies, as best as I can express it, is a a conglomeration of knowledge of many aspects cultures of religions of beliefs of traditions of kingdoms and peoples said to have been traditionally from what is called the Near East, or I would call the Middle East. The reason that I see it as so dangerous is because when you overlay an idea onto a pursuit, like understanding the scriptures and the God inspiring the scriptures in a pure way, trying to take from them what the author intended you to have. You, uh, anyone, whether they realize it or not, will find themselves horrifically encumbered by this heavy cloak uh, laying over top of this pursuit, darkening and suffocating this pursuit, this heavy cloak being called ancient Near Eastern studies. <clears throat> Now, I'm familiar with many of the scholars that are uh, very adept at ancient Near Eastern studies. They know many of these languages. They, they have very strong and tight-knit systems that have been developed over a number of years now in that pursuit. But I'm here to tell you, at risk of great ridicule and scorn, that ancient Near Eastern studies are not the study of the Bible. They are two things that seem to be in harmony because of how they are presented. But as I said, the one only serves to darken, suffocate the other. And what tends to happen is like with any other pursuit of knowledge. If you start out with an incorrect model, if your notions are tainted by something that seems correct, but isn't. You're going to find as you go along that there's so much about it. Let, let's say you're studying a pure discipline, but you've already been tainted with that 
perverted model. Then as you go along and you try to understand this pure discipline, you are going to find that that perverted model is going to be the greatest enemy to you and your acquisition of the truth. And uh, believe me, it's not an easy thing. It, because even the people out there who are uh, atheists or agnostics, they don't, <clears throat> they, I don't think they realize that how much their uh, perceptions of the Bible and uh, that God of the Bible have been distorted and tainted by a counterfeit uh, epistemology, uh, a, a distorted model. And I see not only atheists, uh, various academics and agnostics, I, I also see scholars debating various issues that put so much energy into beating up various straw men. And they're often perceived as, as very talented or brilliant or making such great points because, you know, I'm pretty good with a punching bag. You put a punching bag in front of me and I can do some damage to it. But you put a real live man in front of me who knows how to defend themselves. I might have far more trouble beating that up. It's something to think about. And the reason is it's going to factor into not only our quest here with making sense of these New Testament quotes in Old Testament context, but really all of our pursuits in the studies of Scripture in general. So, uh, also, uh, thank you again for everybody, not only who has been praying for me, as I had descended into uh, a terrible place. I had for weeks and months before, especially since the guided biopsy, where, in my opinion, they took something that was contained and localized and not only did terribly harmful things to it at the source, but released it into my system. And I became uh, increasingly degenerated over a number of weeks to the point where I didn't think I, I had far to go and had only hoped that the um, barbaric and sadistic methods of the modern sick care system were going to provide me with some kind of relief, uh, even knowing that there's no way in the world I should ever trust them. And between um, the goodness of our Father and uh, His grace and all the prayers from all of you who've been praying and the, uh, the hands-on help of a few, I, I feel remarkably better. <clears throat> just in the last week. Absolutely remarkably better in my body and in my mind. And uh, it's only been a three to four day upturn now from a point of existence where I was quite convinced that if something did not change, 
that I did not have a lot of time left. And after four days of uh, various things, I am shocked at how much better I feel in my mind and in my body. So I can only offer everyone who has uh, attributed to that in any way uh, great thanks. So I will try to repay that with with all I can can offer. Uh, so this time, this is a weird one. Uh, the gentleman who did this list, and um, I will scroll up here here real quick. He just he calls it here now. All right, it's the Septuagint online. And it's one source I go to a lot. I like to, I like to know what people have to say about the Septuagint. I like to know what they have to say about the uh, Masoretic scriptures. This happens to be a table that this gentleman provided, is all. And in the table, he gives the New Testament quote as according to the AV, which is the King James, not 1611. Uh, you, you're not going to find too many copies of 1611, like pure 1611 still floating around. Essentially, they call it AV, but it's not purely 1611. It's gone through revisions. So, he provides a New Testament quote as according to AV translation, and then the Septuagint uh, from Brenton's translation, and then uh, back to the Masoretic, so the Old Testament, in the AV or... King James translation. I thought it was really interesting the next quote I saw when I saw it. And, and we've got to hit it because it's in here. I think it's just interesting that they included it. I don't know what it says about how they're looking at this. But he lists uh, Matthew 10, 35 and 36, okay? This is really really interesting. We'll go to it uh, actually in the text. So I'm, I'm in that chapter. I'm in Matthew 10. And uh, this whole chapter, pretty much, uh, we've got Yusho speaking, or Jesus. And this is a nonsensical name. I'm sorry. I don't get upset when people use it or anything like that. Just for me, and how much I've looked at it. Anyways. I'll often put that in there because I assume so often maybe somebody might listen to this for the first time. This might be their first first video. That's why I do that so often. I'm constantly thinking of somebody maybe as being a first time, you know, listener. Um. So, anyways, um, uh, he's speaking pretty much about the whole chapter. Okay. And uh, it starts earlier in Matthew ten five when it says. Uh, Yusho sends out uh, the twelve apostles, and and we could read all that, but I think it's just effective uh, to go down. He's continuing speaking. He's continuing speaking. Now we could start uh, just just a little, just a little earlier, you know. And uh, let's say we start in Matthew ten twenty eight. Now this is still him speaking, and he's speaking to his disciples, and he says. Well, actually, we'll call them apostles because he's sending them out, right? And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in what? In hell? In eternal conscious torment? Gee, is that what we, really what he says? Oh, oh Gehenna. Oh, so Gia, Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom. Hmm. Well, that seems strange to me. It certainly doesn't sound like eternal conscious burning torment. Now, he goes on to say, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. 
Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. That's an interesting segue. <clears throat> well, you see this, uh, therefore, right? He's telling him not to fear men, and then he says, uh, fear ye not therefore, right? Because of what we've seen prior. Ye are more value of, uh, than many sparrows. The therefore, of course, that, and then, so then he goes on and says, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him I will also confess before my father. I, I just say that is odd because I don't see the, um, I don't see the, there's this old way of teaching, you know, they'll say, well, here's how you should study the Bible, right? When you see a therefore, you should instantly ask wherefore, right? Um, and maybe that has to do with fearing men. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I won't rabbit trail it, but then we go on to Matthew uh, 10.34, think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth, I'm not come to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that takes not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. All right. Well, what most, uh, I'm just going to give you what the, the popular uh, interpretation of this is because we know in other parallel passages he uses contrasts such as love me and hate your mother or father does he not he uses contrasts like love or hate at least the translators certainly do so the Matthew the ones that this man cited in his chart Matthew 10 34 and 35 I'm not come to bring peace, not peace, but a sword. Setting a man at variance against his father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's very interesting. Creating a schism like that uh, within the family itself and within neighbors and brothers themselves. Now what the... Um, what the popular interpretation would say that that is because of um, the truth and perhaps those who are filled with the Spirit of Christ and having the truth in them then would be at variance with their own uh, family. Um, they would be at variance with, uh, with their their neighbors or maybe their friends and this this truth this uh, new spirit he brings is going to cause variance because those who are filled with the truth uh, they can't be friendly with those who are filled with lies just doesn't happen so I would say that relatively accurately expresses what the interpretation of that passage would be uh, in a mainstream understanding. So the thing is, the Old Testament reference that's given to this passage, even though we don't have a reference within it because uh, the author who wrote Matthew doesn't cite it, uh, nor does Yusho cite it, but this man gives Micah 7 6 as actually a reference. I thought that was really interesting. I went back to it. Now remember, we had actually just saw Micah uh, chapter 5 as 
one of the Old Testament passages that was that was really easy to look at and make sense of. It was the one about uh, Bethlehem in the suburb of Ephrath, Ephratha, the area of Ephrath. Um, remember, little among Judah and out of you shall come a governor to lead my people. So that was just in uh, Micah 5. <clears throat> remember I had said that uh, uh, Micah's a, uh, he's, he's living in a pretty close similar time as uh, uh, Yeshua or Isaiah. And if you remember, I said, uh, based on what I understand about Obri and my theories, and they're still theoretical, I would tell you that I think his name would be more appropriately pronounced either Mika or just Mike. So, uh, the passage is in Micah 7, and it is uh, verse 6. And, of course, I'm going to put it in context, but I just want to see if if you guys are getting the same sense. If you remember, the the general accepted interpretation of the passage of Matthew that I just read. Now, here is the quote from Micah 7, 6, which was not provided by Matthew or whoever authored Matthew, nor by the speaker. Okay, this was just in this chart. So, who knows, right? How many people would say that this is actually an Old Testament quote put in the New Testament? Because, starting at Micah 7, 1, and this is a continuation from 6, in which 6, the author, is Yahweh speaking to Yisrael, the house of Yisrael. And it continues on from that. Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits. As the grape gleanings of the vintage, there is no cluster to eat. My soul desire the first ripe fruit. The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among them. I would imagine out of the Eretz, the land. Eretz, the land, always specific. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man as brother with a net. That they may do evil with both hands earnestly, the prince asks and the judge for a reward. And the great man, he utters his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. The best of that, and if these were better translations, anyone would see in this dialogue, not dialogue, I'm sorry, in this monologue, a description, they would see and understand how these very people being described are the very people around us today running our own country. Maybe even people we know. The best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of the watchman and thy visitation comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Trust you not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of your mouth from her that lies in your bosom. For the son dishonors the father. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore I will look unto Yahweh, I will wait for the Alayim of my salvation. My God will hear me. So in that context, and if you read it from Micah 6, he's obviously the living God, is saying through Mike, uh, he's indicting the people of Yisrael. And this is what continues from 7-1 on to 
where we reached. And that language, by its English translation, it does sound very similar, doesn't it, to what we read in Matthew. Now, strangely enough, though, you show in Matthew, of course, he says, don't think I came to bring peace. I didn't bring, come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And saying how it would divide, correct? Daughter from her mother. Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. But here, interesting. Because once again, um, like from 7.4, it says the best of them is a briar, the most upright, it's sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of the watchman, thy visitation comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Don't you even trust in a friend. I'm paraphrasing. Don't you trust in a friend. Don't put your confidence even in a guide. Keep the doors of your mouth from her that lies in your bosom. So your wife, I would think that's who would be lying in your bosom. Of course, a lot of people did have a lot of concubines. Um, and I, I've searched and I haven't found one um, uh, condemnation of uh, polygamy yet. And I'm looking for it. Now, Micah 7, 6, For the son dishonors the father, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore, <laughs> and these are in different languages. They're different languages, they're different segues, but they're being translated in very similar ways by these people. Right? Therefore, I'll look unto Yahweh. <clears throat> because of that, because of what he's just seen. Or everything that was just cited, you could say. Now, in Breton's, uh, pretty similar. I mean, in 7.4, I'll take away their goods as a devouring moth, as one who acts by a rigid rule in a day of visitation. Whoa, whoa, thy times of vengeance are come, now shall be their lamentations. Trust not in friends, confide not in guides. Beware of your wife, so as not to commit anything to her. Huh. For the son dishonors his father, the daughter will rise up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Those in his house shall be a man's enemies. But you see, what I'm seeing here in this context is Mike the prophet. He's prophesying against Yisrael, the house of Yisrael. And all of these faults and all of these evils of Yisrael are talked about from 6 on forward to this point. And it seems to me that those few verses that seem close in language, based on their uh, translation, to be similar to what we saw in Matthew. But the context, to me, looks a lot different. I guess what I'm saying here, and I got distracted for a moment because my son's up now, um, is that in Matthew, it of course seems that Yusho is saying that these things are as a consequence of what he has come to do and is doing. Yet in Micah, it seems like this similar language is as a consequence of the evil of this nation of people. Could be a small thing, right? Could be my misunderstanding. True. And again, this passage isn't cited by either the author or the speaker. 
and although the language is very close, it may not absolutely uh, be intended. And so this one's an odd one in this list because of those reasons. So I know that it's been choppy and it's probably going to continue to be choppy because my son's young. I had to, you know, take him to the bathroom, get some breakfast, and now he's not even eating it because I think he wants to play with his train. So, whatever. But I'll try to keep this going. And, um, yeah, there might be some background noise too, but that's life, right? So, as I said, I, I just don't know that there is a, a contextual consistency between those two because I see both of them being precipitated in uh, a bit different ways. However, if one was just doing a word for word and similarity in phrases sort of search, I could see why they would uh, find this passage from Micah. Um, but since neither the author of Matthew, neither the speaker, are referring to this, one could honestly say there's no empirical or provable link between those two. I would like to say that I find it very interesting, of course, that this is a passage, Matthew, that is, with Yusho speaking. This is a passage that it seems is quickly forgotten uh, by most of these people that are, of course, trying to strengthen the links between religions. And by many of those who criticize others because they are sowing discord between brethren, so-called. Uh, whereas a lot of that discord between brethren belongs there because we're talking about the difference between truth and error or light and darkness, right and wrong. That kind of discord is appropriate. The kind of discord that we see in Micah, in my humble opinion, is the discord caused by a society of men and women who are doing nothing but evil. And when you have a society like that, when nobody has a foundation of good, you can't trust those in your own house, nor your own wife, children, brothers. But in the sense that you show speaking, we can see that clearly he is saying that he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword of division, and it would be the truth, and that does divide households very sharply. So that was interesting that that was put on the list. <clears throat> and, and you know what? Um, an atheist or whomever else can't really come along and use that passage in any kind of polemic because, once more, neither the author nor the speaker um, is using that as a reference. They, they don't say, as according to the prophet, or any other such thing. Um, so now we get actually um, <clears throat> into a... Well, with Matthew 11.10. This is going into more of a uh, John the Baptist type of context. Of course, it's not available in Breton's. Um, so this is an interesting exchange, too, uh, between the, the messengers from John the Baptist and Yusha. You'll find that these exchanges, the dialogue, and the information about John the Baptist 
is much different in the document that is called Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. Much different than what you're going to find in really the great majority of any Greek text, whether it's minority or majority text type. So starting from the first verse in Matthew 11.1, 1, and uh, keep in mind that is a cross-reference. It's also tagged in Mark 1.2 and Luke 7.27. I really ought to just read those three in tandem real quick before we look at it in context, because we could look at it in context in Matthew and Mark and Luke, and it could be beneficial to do that. In Matthew 11.10, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The King James English can sometimes make it a little bit difficult concerning who is speaking and who they're speaking to. Um, <clears throat> let's just put it this way. In Matthew 11.7, the author says, And as they departed, Yusho began to say unto the multitude. So he was just talking to the followers of John the Baptist, so called. And he begins to speak to the multitude concerning John. He says, What did you go? I got to translate the King James whenever I can into modern English. <laughs> I do it in my own head. So I might as well do it out loud. <clears throat> Excuse me. What, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? Question mark. But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So, based on what we're seeing here, what we would expect then is that this would be a prophet who was speaking in the stead of Yahweh towards his chosen Messiah concerning someone who would be a herald uh, that would go out before him. And he continues in Matthew 11:11, 11, 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that is born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, now this is the interesting part people have debated about forever. I don't know. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you'll receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he goes into, what shall I like in this generation? He's Elias, Elisha. He says, For who who will receive it? This is Elisha, which was to come. All the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So he's saying here, John is a demarcation. He's saying there was no greater man born than John up to that point. That's what he's saying. Unless there's a problem with the translation, that's what he's saying. And then he says, notwithstanding, so nevertheless. But, 
He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. John. Seems to be like another demarcation. But what we're looking for is context, right? Because we could spend quite a while trying to understand why these things are said. And I guess that isn't the point. <laughs> Even though I think it's beneficial. Mark 1, 2. And we might as well visit that. Uh, Mark 1, 2 and Luke seven twenty seven. If we have it on TSK cross-reference, it'll, it'll usually give us quite a bit of that. It, it only gives us the verse. Okay. I think we should visit real quickly uh, Mark 1, 2. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And we looked at this. We looked at that passage already. And it says, Then John did baptize in the wilderness, and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. This same baptism we're going to see um, also preached by Yusho in Matthew. Same baptism by him. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, I want to visit Luke real quick. You see, I'll get, I'll get lost in my own thoughts about these things very quickly. Uh, Luke 7.27 just to get a better idea of the context here. And and in this in this I I'll read the part with the messengers from John the Baptist just to get the full context, okay? So in Luke starting in 7:18, and the disciples of John showed him of all these things, and John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to you show, saying, "Are you he that should come, or look we for another?" When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist, John Baptist, hath said unto thee, saying, Are thou he that should come, or should we look for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then you show answering, said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you've seen and heard. How that the blind see, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whomsoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see, a reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled, and live delicately, are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, which shall prepare your way before you. For I say to you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Hmm. strange. Right after that it says all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. You want to make sense out of that for me? Because I'm sitting on this side of the microphone being just confused about some of these passages as maybe anybody else. I wish I could understand some of these things. I wish I could understand why he would say that. 
why he would say there was none greater. Of those born of women, there's none greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that's least in the kingdom of Elayim, or I would think Shemaim, the kingdom of heaven, is greater than, than he. He's greater than John. John, <clears throat> sending from prison, got put in prison by Herod. He spoke against the immorality Herod was doing publicly, and John obviously had a great deal of influence. Maybe John didn't expect that. So he sends these messengers. Are you the one that we're, we're expecting to see, or should we look for someone else? Seemed like John was confused. Of course, in the books of the prophets, I mean, just because they wrote all kinds of information, far-reaching in scope and depth, doesn't mean that they had a full understanding of all that they were writing. So, you know, in that account of Yusho's baptism, when he shows up to him, and he says he wants him to, he, Yusho, he wants... Yohanan, Yohanan, John, to baptize him. And then John says that he shouldn't baptize him. He says he's not worthy to baptize him. He says, I'm not worthy to untie your shoelaces, unloose your sandal, whichever it is, right? And then Yusho replies to him, but we should do this so that all things would be fulfilled. All right. Keeping all that in mind, we're obviously going to be in Malachi 3.1. And it's in both uh, A.V. and Brenton's. And we can't start in one because we're not going to get the context. So I have to start a little bit before. So in Micah, starting in chapter 2, there is rebuke against Louis, um, the house of the priests, priesthood. And then starting in verse 10, there is a rebuke against Yehuda, who was prophesied, of course, to be the one that the scepter should not depart from till Shiloh come. And uh, uh, towards the end of two, um, continuing in the detail of the rebuke, I could start a few verses before, you know, um, to, like Malachi 2.14. Yet you say, wherefore, because Yahweh had been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, yet is she your companion and the wife of your covenant. And did not he make one, yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a God? This is such terrible... You know, nobody speaks like this anymore. We'll get something slightly better from Brenton, but nobody speaks like that anymore crying out loud. I don't even know if I can read it out of there. It's just such... I'm going to do web. Okay? Yet you say, why? Because Yahweh has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and the wife of your covenant. Did he not make you one, although he had the residue of the Spirit? Why one? He sought godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. That's a little bit more understandable, right? For I hate divorce, says Yahweh, the God of Yisrael, and him who covers his garment with violence, says Yahweh Tzabaeth. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you don't deal treacherously. You've wearied Yahweh with your words, yet you say, how have we wearied him? 
in that you say everyone who does evil is good in Yahweh's sight, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? I don't know why they'd say that. Matthew, or I'm sorry, Malachi 3.1 Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek, that's the Adun, like the Master whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant whom you desire, behold, he comes, says Yahweh Tzabaeth. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who will stand when he appears, for he's like a refiner's fire, and like launderer's soap, and he'll sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he'll purify the sons of Louis, and refine them as gold and silver. And they shall offer to Yahweh offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Yehuda and Jerusalem will be pleasant to Yahweh, as in the days of old, as in ancient years. <clears throat> So you folks, um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it on this. Listen, I can't I can't say it enough. I'm not trying I'm not trying to attack the scriptures here. I'm not doing that. But uh, I've read these things so many times myself, and thought about them. And I've heard so many people who would think to be expositors of these things. And most of these people are graduates of some level of uh, some Bible college or seminary. And them having an understanding, comprehension, and... Uh, let's just say, a good command of what's going on here, contextually, between these two passages from the uh, New Testament to the Old and the context of the passages in the New Testament that I was just reading. That seems strange. I've already asked you before. John the Baptist, baptism, where we see it. We see ritual washings, correct. We see a lot of different ones. But, so this man John, he comes um, preaching uh, this, you know, this water baptism for the remission of sins, or a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You know, I can see baptism as uh, symbolic. But I see a lot of language, too, in the Old Testament that doesn't end up jiving with me in what I see in the New. I still don't have the answers for these things. All I really have is the... Uh, sincerity to say that it doesn't 100% add up to me. And there's a lot that uh, sometimes seems to be missing. When, when we're looking for a unified understanding, a unified message, in the pages of Scripture, and especially when we have to go between the New and the Old Testament, and anybody who would trot along and say that they've got this under control and they very much understand what's going on, I think that they're full of it. And I think that, I think that they're trying to protect their jobs because people get paid really good. And not only do they get paid really good, the people who do this, not only pastors, but uh, university professors 
chief editors of modern software, Bible software, everybody in this business, the biz, they get paid pretty good. And on top of being paid pretty good, they get a lot of perks like, you know, respect. Right this way, pastor such and such. Oh, theological professor of what? <sighs> Fascinating. <gasps> and people go alight and they glow around you like a bunch of little satellites. Because there's a lot of perks to this. So you can't be presented with these kinds of things that are having trouble fitting together. They're puzzle pieces that some dumb guy like me is having trouble putting together. And, and he's not having trouble putting them together because he has any kind of inherent or pre-existing animosity. I've got none of that towards the text at all. Of the New Testament, of the Old Testament, of the characters, of the God we see, or this Messiah. I don't have any pre-consisting animosity. I don't have uh, an axe to grind. I'm not trying to sell any books. And I'm not trying to hurt anyone's faith. But I am trying to tell you in the most honest way I can. That so often these passages that are cited, they seem so often pulled from their context. And I will freely admit, I, maybe I don't understand the context very well. How about that? That's real possible. Um, besides the possibility that I have mentioned earlier, uh, with there being huge problems in translations, that's That ought to be a given. If it's not a given, ah, it's just going to lead to more confusion. I'm willing to admit it's, it's, you know, it's me. But, if it is just me, I'd like somebody to help me out. And just help me to understand. Why am I not seeing these things? Because... Like I've said before, I think one of the things that keeps a lot of people from going down these roads and maybe admitting some of these things is a great amount of fear. And there's different kinds of fear out there. There's a healthy good fear. And there's a fear that is sort of this phobic fear. There's a phobia. You know, many many people have that who are professed Christians. They have a phobia of of dissecting the Bible and questioning the status quo in any way, shape, or form. And <clears throat> it, everything that you would understand, let's just say about Jesus. Let's say about Jesus the Christ, everything you understand about him. Do you think that were he right here, right now, right in front of you, and you told him in the most honest, sincere way, I'm having trouble seeing the point of the context of a lot of the stuff I'm seeing in the New Testament. I'm, I'm having some difficulties seeing the point, or, or let's just say seeing the, uh, the harmony of contexts between some of this, the things that I've seen you quote in what scriptures we have. I'm having trouble. I'm confused. Okay? I'm confused. And I'm sorry I'm confused. I'm sorry I can't figure this stuff out. But I'm confused about it.
Is he going to stand there in condemnation? Is he going to say that you don't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear? Because there's so much confusion out there. And it seems to me like it's mostly those those false preachers who, again, a lot of uh, money and respect and soft living factors into what they say to other people and how they approach certain things. They might be the ones who offer you uh, an interpretation or an explanation that doesn't add up. And when you're still looking confused or when you say something back to them, it says, I don't think that adds up. That still looks like eisegesis to me. And maybe they come back and say, you don't must not have the eyes to see or the ears to hear. But would my master, the Messiah, would my God, my Father, who, who asks us to reason with him, uh, the God who, after uh, giving the law and his commandments, said in Deuteronomy 30 that these commands that I give you, they're, they're not they're not high up in heaven so that one would have to go and retrieve them and bring them back down to you. They're not over the sea that one would have to travel and get them and bring them back to you. He says they are in your mouth. They are in your heart. They are near you. This is not too much for you to understand. So when we get to all of these points where we don't understand, I don't think it's healthy. I don't think we should have a phobia about saying we don't understand it, we don't see it, we don't see a correlation. If, if somebody says that they want you to use your mind and understand things, but then gives you things that are clearly that clearly go against that that's inconsistency and it's contradictory and what i'm saying is from the entire witness of what i see concerning this god that we're talking about in scriptures his messiah we're speaking of in scriptures from the grand accumulation of their personalities. It doesn't seem to me that that would ever be the case as to, on the one hand, give very clear uh, instructions and to be merciful and to be kind. And on the other hand, give confusion and to not have the patience to help uh, the the regular common person like me who does not understand um, the grace and the uh, the uh, I don't know what to call it. Well, the understanding, in one way or another, the understanding of it. See, if that's, if it, if that's the case, then the, uh, the character of who we're talking about, this God and, and his Messiah, that they don't seem to be consistent if that were the case. And that's why I said I don't think that we should be phobic about it. I don't think there's anything wrong with having fear. I think fear is a good thing. Especially fear of him who has made you, who does sustain you, who can destroy you, who can do what he cho what he pleases. Uh, your sovereign. That fear is good. A phobia is something based on a misunderstanding or an ignorance. It's not a healthy thing. So, uh, to coin a phrase. Uh, 
I'll be right back the, uh, at this again, God willing, <laughs> next time. So uh, everybody, thanks for joining me. Uh, I hope you are well. Bye.